I'm Anne Burrows, and I'm the president and CEO of, of Janum. And I'm delighted to welcome you all here to our program this evening. I know that it's going to be entertaining, it's going to be educational, and it's going to be inspiring. So we have with us an extraordinary array of people that you can see, a multi-generational group of activists that trace their roots from the 1970s to the present. And what we're going to hear from them about tonight is how each one of them has been part of this extraordinary movement, this extraordinary political movement that has built up over the years, and how each of them and their organizations have helped to power, have helped to power that movement. So I'm not going to tell you too much more about the, the program or the panel, because I know that each one of them will tell you about about themselves, but I am going to tell you a little bit about Eddie, about Eddie Wong, who is our moderator this evening. And of course, for most of you, he requires absolutely no introduction at all. But there were some things that were written in the, in the bio, which I thought were just wonderful. So instead of trying to reduce his life to anecdote, I'm going to read you what they wrote for me about Eddie. They said, he was born in, in Los Angeles, and he was raised on rock and roll. So how many of us in the room can relate to that, right? <laughs> he became a student activist at UCLA in 1968. How many of us can relate to that? I was a student activist in South Africa, but I'm sure many of us in this room were organizing at the same time that he was in, in the 1960s. So he's managed to stay active in progressive politics and community and artwork for most of his life. He's one of the founders of Visual Communications, which of course all of you know. Um, and some of you may not know that he's also the co-curator of the Janum exhibition at First Light, The Dawning of Asian Pacific America. And for those of you who haven't seen it, I really would encourage you to come back. It's extraordinary, it's exciting, and it's very, very illuminating. And many of you will recognize yourselves, of course, in, in the images and, and the activities. And apparently, Eddie loves to travel. He loves to watch movies. He's the publisher of East West E-Zine, which we all know. And generally, he loves to raise hell. So, Eddie, over to you. I, I do love rock and roll, but I promise not to sing tonight. Um, I do want to uh, say a couple things to just uh, kind of set the tone. And the first thing is about about history, uh, we're, we're actually sitting on historic, uh, I think it's Tongva people's land, and we're in the historic Japanese American community, which started in 1905, and just right outside the door were, were the buses that took people uh, from the Japanese American community uh, after World War II broke out to Santa Anita racetrack and then on to various uh, camps, concentration camps. So we're uh, at a very sacred place, actually, you know? And it's that sense of history, I think, that really, um, when you have a sense of history, it adds so much meaning to the work that you do as an activist or as a citizen or as a, just a person in the community because you actually do understand that there's this, this river that runs through time and that river includes all the experiences that our people went through. So tonight we're gonna to have a, a, a sense of that. And um, you know, this program is actually part of uh, At First Light, uh, the dawning of Asian Pacific America. And I know some people here have seen the exhibit, but many have not. So I'm gonna show a short clip, uh, which is from my perspective, some of the themes that went into the, the curation process of what we pick, how we picked uh, images, and the themes that we want to express. So I'd like to just run that clip now.
Um, we just added another element to the exhibit today, and that is uh, something called Guided by Cell. And so several people on the panel tonight actually contributed commentary. And what it is is that you, you go up to a photograph that's in the exhibit, and there's a little number underneath it, and you dial this phone number on your, t on your cell phone, and you punch in that number, and you'll hear Mia Iwataki's voice talking about something called SINSIP, which was like an Asian American movement picnic uh, back in the 70s. So, and also, you know, you'll get a sense of what's the story behind the photos. And we also have like 30 videos um, that are drawn from the archives uh, of some of the still images that were in the archives. And we've interviewed people like Phyllis Chu, who's an activist in Chinatown and a teacher at Castellar, talking about what life was like in the early 70s for immigrant families in Chinatown. So I encourage you to go see the exhibit. Um, and um, you can see all those videos online. You don't have to actually be in person at the, at the, at the exhibit. And just go to the Janum website, and there'll be a link to click you into all the videos. Um, well, I want to talk no more now about, about the panel. Uh, we're going to do this in three parts, OK? Uh, the first question I'm going to ask everyone is to introduce themselves. Basically, you know, take a couple of minutes to talk about what you do as an organizer. And more importantly, why did you become an activist? And uh, we'll start with that question. And then after we finish a round of everybody, um, we'll ask a second question. And that question is, what event or campaign or activity uh, really shaped you as an activist and, and the values that you have today? And what lessons do you have to share from that experience? So it's a broad question, but really meaningful in different ways for different people. And then finally, we're going to throw it open to all the panelists to talk about where do they see the movement building to? I mean, how do we enlarge our numbers? How do we get more people to participate? And kind of what's really at stake at this moment in time? So we'll start with that. And we'll start with Kathy. Um, hi, everybody. Good evening. My name is Kathy Huang. Um, this is my son, Cosmos. He's a Mike Hogg, so sorry. <laughs> you got to have a, a backup. His is switched off. Um, so I know I have two minutes, so let me um, get on with it. Um, but I'm actually from the East Coast. I'm originally from Connecticut. My parents are refugees from Vietnam, and that was really formative for my experience um, coming of age um, as a you know, young person growing up in a place where I felt really isolated. I felt like, you know, who are the other people who look like me in my community? Um, my, I always ask my parents, like, why did you go to Connecticut? Like, what drew you there? And, you know, of course, it was just through family sponsorship that we already had a family member there who were able to sponsor my parents over, um, you know, during the war. They came to the U.S. in 1979. And... You know, for a lot of uh, a lot of refugee, um, you know, immigrants, the the experience can be so traumatic that they don't want to talk about it, and that's, I mean, that's of course perfectly understandable. And for my parents, though, um, luckily for me, they were very open about sharing what that experience was like um, from what drew them to say, you know what, F it, we're, we gotta go. You know, we're gonna leave and just leave everything behind and go um, and maybe die on the way, um, but hope for a better life for ourselves and for our potential, you know, children. Um, and to like what it was like to be in the camps, um, to what it was like to be in a place where, you know, they didn't speak the language and they were foreigners. And so hearing about that story and then kind of seeing the parallels, um, you know, in my own life growing up as an Asian American young girl in a place where I didn't see people who looked like me and and then understanding that the deeper racism and um, you know xenophobia that I felt and that my parents were feeling were part of this larger picture around um, you know the political um, economy that was taking place at the time that led them to flee their home country and come to the U.S. and then you know how that shaped our experiences um, in Connecticut and ultimately when I um, graduated from high school and began um, college you know 
there was um, there had been a lot of you know conversation around what you know the U.S. was going to do in the Middle East and the continuation of the war in the Middle East, and that just struck me that wow, here it is happening in my lifetime, and we're creating more refugees. And I thought I've got to I've got to do something you know with my life that's going to be meaningful and you know continue um, some kind of a legacy for myself and my family of like what our struggle means for our broader community. And so that's what brought me to working in um, my community and working more broadly in the labor movement, which is where I ultimately um, ended up. I was just looking for work after college. I was like, I'm going to do something, you know, I'm going to do something, you know, that I'm going to make change. And like, I apply for all these jobs and I, I wanted to go to New York City because I was like, I'm getting out of Connecticut, and, you know, and, um, you know, because I'd gone to state school and like the only place that called me was this union. I was like, all right. Cool. And then that's where I realized, wow, you know, like there's all this stuff that's big picture, but I can do something right here, you know, with with workers and workers are they look like me and they look like my community, they look like my family. And that's where I brought this um, connection out to the work that I do. And I've been working in the labor movement since. Um, hello, everyone. Um, good evening. My name is Thomas Chung. Um, I use he, him, his pronouns and they, them, theirs pronouns. Um, I, I grew up in San Gabriel, um, which is actually a predominantly um, API community. So I'm, um, I think I was probably like, um, I think I was socialized that way. And, but I also saw like a lot of problems within the Asian American community, like anti-blackness and colorism, like as I was growing up. Um, and that sort of shaped like, um, I wouldn't, <laughs> and I, I, I think that sort of shaped like my early, um, I guess, politicization. politicization. Um, and it was like really, um, in middle school when I um, realized that I was queer and that I was at that intersection of being queer and API and dark skin kind of um, being like, um, and it was in high school, I found a club called um, the Genders and Sexualities Alliance Club. Um, they were previously known as Gay Straight Alliances. Um, and that was like the first place where I found like my, I guess, um, a second family and like a support system. And like, um, it, it was like a place that um, was, in addition to being a place of support and a, be, being a place of like social interaction, it was also a place of activism. Um, at, for the GSA on my campus, um, we were organizing for um, gender inclusive restrooms. Um, and I think, um, I, at that moment, I wasn't really exactly involved with that campaign. I just watched it from like a third party, I guess. And I, I don't think I really became an activist and organizer until I was approached by um, the president of the GSA at the time. And she introduced me to the Genders and Sexualities Alliance Network, which is basically an organization that supports um, the GSAs um, across like more than a thousand high school GSAs across California, and they do a lot of um, youth empowerment, um, youth mentorship, and their um, intention is to mobilize um, trans and queer youth um, and trans and queer youth of color specifically um, to become activists and organizers in the fight for economic justice, racial justice, and um, gender justice. And um, ever since then, I became a leader within um, GSA Network, and I've um, I, um, I've received a lot of um, like <laughs> I've received a lot of um, education, like political education from them, and I'm like I've I'm reciprocating a lot of that education to um, like my peers and other young people, and like we do workshops about intersectionality, anti-blackness in the Asian American community. Um, trans, um, like restorative justice, all these like different um, topics that um, are essentially part of activism and organizing. And um, I, I, I've been a part of many campaigns that GSA Network has supported. And I'm right. I just graduated high school, so I'm and I'm moving up to Berkeley. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I'm moving up to Berkeley, so I'm like, you know, trying to figure out where I, I'll fit into the movement when I'm in the Bay and trying to like make sure I'm here for the people. Um, I'm probably gonna make a lot of trips to Oakland, not gonna be funneled into a tech company. Um, so I'm like, I'm like my drive and my passion for like, um, for intersectional liberation um, has like, has a lot of like has driven me to like be has driven me to be involved in um, all, like a lot of different campaigns and and within GSA network and has, and it really like um, I really understood the power of youth organizing and how like it's really important to reach youth um, early on to politicize them and get them involved in um, campaigns um, and our movements so then they say so that they say sustainable and um, that like, you know, the future is in their hands um, and youth organizing is important. Um, <laughs> and that's sort of what I wanted to emphasize and intersectionality in that youth organizing is also really important. Um, yeah, um, did that encapsulate how I became an activist? Um, yeah. <laughs> Good job. So a long time ago, I used to be a youth. <laughs> and I did organizing then. Uh, so first, um, a gentleman named uh, Uncle Roy Morales introduced me to a group called SIPA, Search to Involve Filipino Americans. And uh, that's how I got started, really. And then he became a mentor to me and also a good friend. Um, and. So uh, that's, that's how it started for me. But uh, along the way, I, I picked up a lot of other things. So I was also, um, <laughs> I also uh, got involved in other groups, uh, the, the major group being the Union of Democratic Filipinos, or the KDP. And that KDP organization was a national organization formed in 73. <laughs> Uh, by a group of uh, Filipino activists from across the country. And that was, I guess, our left wing of the Filipino American community at that time. Uh, since it was a national organization, we had um, chapters in different cities and carried on campaigns against the Marcos dictatorship in the Philippines, uh, support for uh, democratic rights uh, in our community, as well as uh, some big campaigns like the Narciso Perez case of two uh, Filipino nurses in Ann Arbor, Michigan, who were falsely accused of trying to murder and murdering uh, VA hospital uh, uh, patients. Uh, we were successful in that campaign in leading it. Uh, another struggle that we were involved in at the time was the International Hotel in, uh, in San Francisco, where uh, activists were actually integral to the whole struggle there and part of the uh, uh, tenants union that um, led the struggle there for uh, low cost housing for elderly. Uh, and along the way, I, I also attended uh, what uh, were called the Filipino People's Far West Conventions or the FWCs. And, and that's how I met my wife. <laughs> I don't know if she's still here. She was up here with our grandsons earlier. Are you still here? She left. <laughs> So now I can talk about her. <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, we both became activists in the KDP, and so uh, we were both uh, doing a lot of community work, starting off first as students, and then going into community work, and then uh, a lot of things led into another thing. Uh, I was also blessed to be uh, co-founder of both Samahang Filipino at UCLA and um, Kababayan at UC Irvine. So I'm a co-founder of two organizations that still exist. Um, I'm currently a librarian at Loyola Law School and also uh, teach one class at Pasadena City College, History of Asian Pacific Americans. And I was uh, also uh, appointed by Governor Brown to be on the uh, State uh, Library Services Board. So I've done a lot of different things along the way, and uh, 
I got a couple of grandsons, like, but bigger <laughs> than him. And they're also quite active. So uh, got a lot of things that I've done, and we, I'm looking forward to this conversation today. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Tito, she, her pronouns. Um, and speaking of youth organizing and the energy that they have, they just have so much energy. Um, so I'm in, by day, I am a teacher, um, hoping to get my teaching credential for elementary and middle school social studies. And then, um, um, I guess by night, uh, but uh, I uh, volunteer with the Chinatown Community for Equitable Development, CCED, which um, focuses on anti-gentrification efforts, which is anti-displacement. Right, and then uh, where we are a multi, we're all volunteers, multi-generational, multi-ethnic um, community organizing in Chinatown. Um, and then I also uh, volunteer with summer activist training. So if we're talking about youth uh, activism, summer activist training is a um, happens every year, and it's a three-day training where we put all these interested young Asian Americans together and essentially teach them wh what it really means to be an activist and organizer and concrete skills that they have to really build a network in Los Angeles with a bunch of grassroots Asian American organizations. Um, then I also uh, work with Free Radicals, which is a awesome activist collective that focuses on the intersection between science and social justice. And I think if we're th really thinking about how to bring people into the movement, everything can be decolonized and to be rethought of in terms of how we really approach things in a more just way. Um, socially just way. And so for myself, like, I do a lot of things and I think that's because um, for me, I think like the po I did a lot of volunteer work for a long time, very service oriented. And I wouldn't say that I really became an activist until I really saw my like, so felt the need to serve myself. And I think this is a very important part of um, activism work is seeing like how much we have it, we are, how much our own stake is in the issue in the sense that our liberation really is bound together. Um, and so for me, that meant like, you know, like I have a lot at, st at stake when it comes to my own humanity and how I can really engage in the world where someone else is being dehumanized and I see myself in that person. Especially when there's so much of my history, I am a second generation Chinese American whose parents were also uh, refugees of the Vietnam War. So we're twice immigrants. And I think that also adds to like the story of like what migration patterns and how that, you know, really like, like, you know, working class roots, like quite literally, but also routes, right, from different places and diaspora. Um, so I think about that a lot and think of how, like, because of, like, our immigration story, like, how much has been lost in terms of, like, both the cultural piece in the sense that I am currently still reclaiming my native tongue, uh, Cantonese, right? Um, have a lot to do to reclaim that, reclaim, um, as an educator, I think of reclaiming what it means to be free in the human body, like how our education system really stifles students into staying in a room for eight hours a day, and how really, like, our bodies are so much more active than that, right? But we start them young in terms of teaching them, like, sit down, do your work, just follow like the systems that be instead of really disrupting those systems. And I think that's been really what's been really exciting in terms of like my own stake in movement building, which is like how do I reclaim my body? Um, how do I reclaim these streets with my body? Disrupting these systems um, with not just like the theoretical pieces where we like talk about these issues, but really physically with my body and what like this body is capable of. Um, so yeah, thank you. Good evening. My name is Aurora. I'm from the Filipino Workers Center. I moved to California in 2008. That was my first time to leave the Philippines. So um, I was 28. Um, the, the first time that I rode an airplane, I was a PR writer for the Y2K Commission. So that, <laughs> that bug. So that, that was my only opportunity to get on an airplane because I can't afford to buy a ticket. Um, I became an activist because of my parents, just because um, my mom wanted me to become a doctor. The whole family wanted me to become a nurse, but then my dad wanted me to become a lawyer. So I chose somewhere in between. <laughs> so, um, so I enrolled at the University of the Philippines. I majored in journalism. But my, my passion was the theater. 
um, I became a member of the UP Repertory Company. What we usually do is we do lightning theater. We do street theater. Uh, I wrote some plays and also performed. I was a little bit tall compared to my other um, um, teammates. So I would just read. And then um, what happens is you, every semester you enroll someone or there's an initiation, people stay there um, for six months. So I would have to find someone who could be you know, at the same height and perform. So for four years, I waited for that team. So my first time to perform was my last year in college and it was awesome. Just because, um, you know, you learn how to move. You've been writing all these street plays for three years and um, it was kind of my self-expression. I'm gonna do one before I leave college. After college, um, it, I had a hard time finding work just because if you're from the University of the Philippines, that means you're poor. Um, we didn't have all the resources, the books. We photocopied materials, and that means you have to pay 50 centavos, and that's money you don't have. Um, I moved to the US because um, I fell in love with someone. Uh, for a Filipina in their, you know, almost reaching 30, even though you have options, the only way you can stay here in the US is to marry, to get married, right? Um, so I was lucky because after college, we've, um, and that stint with the Y2K commission, I was able to get my tourist visa. And that was good for 10 years. I didn't have to get married. I didn't have to do anything. Um, so I was able to get here. Um, and then I started working at a legal services provider company um, minimum wage, I, they told me I can get my raise after six months. So every six months, I go to the HR person, I knock, hey, do I get my raise today? It's my sixth month. I did this for four years until on the fifth year, I'm not doing it anymore. So they offered me the job, made me manager, but then that meant I would still be earning a third of, you know, yeah, so I said no. I walked away, was unemployed for like six months until I found the Filipino Workers Center. So I kept calling the Filipino Workers Center for three months. So my mom said, no, keep doing it, keep doing it. Maybe no one's answering the phone. No, somebody's picking up the phone. <laughs> They're just not giving the, my message to the executive director because I was, um, during that four years I studied, um, I took up paralegal studies at the UCLA extension um, while working full time because I couldn't afford it anyway. Um, so finally, Akalina Soriano Versosa uh, gave me a call and said, yes, you can volunteer. Um, I volunteered to do immigration services um, under the supervision of their pro bono attorneys. And then three years after, I'm the program head for the anti-trafficking program. So it, it, it's a long journey, but um, it, it's worth it because um, we've helped a lot of labor trafficking victims. And because I'm from the Philippines, I speak fluent Tagalog. And I know how it is, what the root causes are, why people leave the Philippines, why is there labor migration, why is, um, why is the Filipino labor force kind of, this is our biggest import, right? Our biggest export is our people. And um, my mom's a uh, domestic uh, caregiver in the UK. She just retired. She retired because she broke her hip, not because she wanted to. Um, my dad uh, was assistant, sh um, assistant cook where my mom um, worked at the nursing home. And um, they're, they're trying to retire in the province. Um, it's two hours away from the capital from Manila, but because of traffic, it's five hours now. So yeah, so that's me, thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jonathan. Most folks call me JP. I'm with the Korean Resource Center. Um, our organization is headquartered out in Koreatown, Los Angeles. We have two offices in Koreatown, one in Orange County in my hometown of Fullerton. Um, and uh, really, we're like a multifaceted organization that really provide that prioritizes grassroots services 
um, provides political and community education, as well as being able to engage in advocacy and civic engagement. And so really our model is what we consider like a holistic model of being able to meet the grassroots needs of people who need immediate needs every day coming through our doors, whether that's around being able to have access to immigration legal services, being able to find out where they can be able to have access to healthcare. Um, we find those opportunities to build relationships with people, being able to keep it to the fundamentals of, of organizing and relationship building, and then being able to build into advocacy where we can be able to shift power. And that's really, our, our tactics and our strategies are really here to be able to build power here in this community. Um, for, for me, where I, so I'm, as I mentioned, I'm from Fullerton, California, still living in the household that I, that I grew up in uh, with, with my mother. Uh, my mother is, um, is a 33-year uh, teacher, public school teacher in Southeast LA. Um, she's been a UTLA member ever since. Uh, her first year of being able to teach was her first year being able to strike. I was able to join her 30, over 30 years later to be able to join her on the second, this, on the second strike uh, this earlier this year. Um, and so really for me, um, the way I got started was, uh, was kind of a long journey of like being able to be w a witness to my mother, being an organizer, of uh, being a single mother, being able to organize her entire life and you know, being a witness to that. Um, and then being able to grow up in a household uh, that was impacted by the 92 civil unrest um, and being able to have very hard dialogues at home. Um, being able to actually open up that conversation um, to what had happened uh, in, the, in the 2000 Bush era, uh, where there was a lot, uh, a lot of sentiment of anti-war in a place where, in Orange County, where Reagan and Bush were considered God. Um, and so in a neighborhood like that, in a place that I grew up, and in an identity in a community where, um, where uh, a community and our identity and our culture was being hijacked by by evangelical faith, um, conservative values, and, and U.S. nationalism. Um, we had, uh, had kind of grown up in this area of just, just like a, a mix of identities. Um, had gone to college at UC Irvine in 2006. Um, had, uh, in 2008, had been on, had been on a road to, um, to Jerusalem at the time. And it was in November 2008. I was on my way to the West Bank and um, on election day when Obama got elected. And um, I actually didn't actually know what had happened that day, in part because I, I, I had not been privy on the road. But what I had known was the fact that um, the taxi driver who I had met that day could not be more excited to be able to actually <laughs> engage in a time when he had believed whether it was warranted or not, like whether it, was, it came true or not, uh, believe that the vote of the United States would impact the rest of the globe and that he believed that the welfare of his family and the welfare of his children would be, would be rooted in the democracy of the United States. And um, since then, uh, had not actually believed that I'd ever get into electoral work. I'd, I, I was actually aspiring to be a teacher as well. Um, and before I was about to apply for a program, had recognized, had recognized at least within myself that I just wanted to be able to explore, being, be able to bring more into, of an experience of my own life into the classroom that I just felt wasn't prepared yet for my own journey. Um, had started organizing when I graduated in 2010. Um, didn't know what organizing was in my first organizing interview. I had shared that I organized my room very well. <laughs> and, um, I was like, I don't even know what organizing is. Uh, I knew that, I, but I knew that the stories of like the friends and community members that I had around me um, had, to, had to change more so than what I, could, I, I individually could offer. And that political systemic change, specifically around immigration reform and being able to create pathways in citizenship and increase pathways in citizenship for my peers, families, and friends, um, can only happen uh, if I were to be able to advocate and organize with others. And so I uh, didn't actually start organizing here in California. I actually started organizing in the Northwest of Portland, uh, predominantly working with black communities in Portland uh, to enroll before the ACA, uh, which was called Healthy Kids. For, uh, it was like the uh, Medicaid enrollment for, for children under 18. Um, and had kind of moved around across the country, really emphasizing around youth organizing, youth civic engagement work, 
um, across the country in seven different states. Um, had found my home back, Orange County kind of blew up into an organizing scene six years ago. Uh, had decided to be able to move back and got the opportunity to be able to change the home county that had, cons that had revered conservatism and, and uh, Reaganism into, got into a, like, I, that had revered that into an ideology and got to be able to transform it and start, at least start the transformation alongside the communities that I get to work with every day to be able to do this. Um, so uh, I'm still on this journey now. I'm excited to be able to share that journey with y'all. And I'm excited to be able to share that in the dialogue with everyone here today. So thank you. Okay. Is it on? Oh, yes. wow. Okay. Okay, so I'm one of the OGs, so that's why I have notes, because I have to think farther back. But the question was, you know, how, how did you become an activist? So when I was going to college, there was no movement. There was a civil rights movement, and you know, um, the Black Panthers and the Brown Berets were just starting at that time. And I was just going to school, working, and partying on the weekends. And there was a, a bunch of old guys at school that used to sit around and argue about current events and talk about Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. And I was just, I was really interested in it because I had never been thinking about those things. And they talked about meeting on Thursday nights at Ben Yano's bar, the Alibi Club on 54th and Arlington. And so I said, hey, can I go? And they said, there's no women allowed. <laughs> and so of course, you know, I kept bugging and bugging. And they said, okay, we'll have one meeting where we open it up. That meeting that I went to introduced me to the Chicano movement. They had um, two groups of speakers one from the United Farm Workers Organizing Committee, and the others were from the Brown Berets. And Joel Serta from the United Farm Workers Organizing Committee talked about the conditions that the, the grape pickers were working under, how they were underpaid, they were getting sick, they were dying. And what they started to do is they couldn't take it anymore. They built a strong coalition and they organized a national boycott, grape boycott. And I know it had deep roots because my mom and my church would not buy grapes. And so I was, you know, it, it kind of was bringing current events home to, you know, who, who we were seeing that night. Then the Brown Berets started talking. And they talked about how, um, how the uh, poor education, the poor conditions in their community, the police brutality towards the um, uh, Chicano community, they related that to the whole history of oppression of uh, brown people in the United States. And they talked about the programs that they were building and how they were committed to change the situation by any means necessary. And my mind was blown. And I mean, here, you know, we, we were seeing nothing on, on the media about this. And here are these like Chicano warriors wearing these brown berets and, and um, talking about self-determination and um, you know, building a community and fighting for the people. And it was like all of a sudden everything kind of came together. It was like a light bulb went off. And the next day I dropped out of school, <laughs> I quit my job, and I went to work for the farm workers. Okay, my parents didn't know this. <laughs> so I was still, you know, going coming home every day and you know. But um, <laughs> So the Brown Berets kind of um, took me in, sort of mentored me, and um, with them I went to my first organizing meeting. I went to the first march, the first demonstration. I'm pretty sure I was at those East LA um, high school blowouts in uh, 67 or where, whenever it was, and then the uh, Chicano Moratorium. And then I, I, I learned from them. Um, I saw how effective they were in um, mobilizing and organizing people. I saw the stuff like the effective use of slogans, like they would be talking, they would, Viva La Raza, you know, um, Chicano pride, you know, celebrate our community, and Viva La Causa, you know, fight for the community, build our programs, and um, uh, resist the, you know, police. And it, it just, you know, it had a really, really heavy impact on me, and it really, uh, that's what, turned me into an activist. You know, I came through the Chicano movement. 
And um, I, I remember that um, I was starting to, you know, um, read radical newspapers more and everything. And, and so uh, one of the people that I was friends with, he, he was a cellmate of Eldridge Cleaver, who was one of the Panther leaders. And he had written a book called Soul on Ice, which was, a, you know, I guess a, a bestseller around that time. And he uh, was being released from San Quentin. So they had a house party or, you know, kind of a house party, a meeting with him with some other organizations. And they took me to that meeting. So it was like really heady times. And, you know, um, uh, you know, it was a really good and strong introduction to the movement. But I always felt like when we were marching in the streets and they were saying, viva la raza, viva la causa, and they would say, Viva la Hauponesa, you know, and I, I kind of really, really wanted to be a part of an Asian movement and, you know, have that kind of pride and, and march with people like that. And so I guess the next question, Eddie, was, you know, uh, or should I just talk? Go ahead. <laughs> well, after, um, I'm skipping over a few years, but... Um, one, one of the uh, things that Eddie asked us um, was what, what um, were some major campaigns that were really important to you? And so for me, the Jack's Asian Involvement Office, which was a, a, a community movement office, actually it was almost like the first Asian movement center. And it was in Little Tokyo in the Sun build, Building on Weller Street, which is no longer there. And... Um, I bring this up because I feel that the Asian movement really has um, a lot to, owes a lot to the Black Panther movement, to the Brown Berets, to the civil rights movement. And when we used to read the, the news, the media would talk about the Panthers and say, oh, you know, only talk about the armed struggle, you know, armed militancy aspect of them, but they never talked about the serve the people programs mm -hmm. that the Panthers did. And that's like the free breakfast program, free clothing, you know housing, and in a sense, the Asian Involvement Office, you know, we modeled ourselves, you know, after, after that in building Serve the People programs that were based on um, self-determination, self-help, meaning helping each other to help ourselves rather than sometimes today, I, oh, I just want to say there was no federal funding, everything was voluntary, and um, at that time, we started also living collectively because when you don't get paid, <laughs> you have to live together to be able to survive. Um, uh, okay, I lost my train. See, this is what happens when you get old. <laughs> uh, okay, so we, um, we built Serve the People programs and we also looked to see who were the most neglected segments of our community. And at that time, it was the Issei, our first generation Japanese, American, Japanese men that were living in the old hotels in Little Tokyo. And it was um, people like the Asian American hardcore. And those, those were people that um, were ex-felons, ex-addicts that were trying to transition back into the community. So we brought them together. As Sandy remembers and Mo and Kathy are here. And I remember the first um, field trip we took with Hardcore and the Issei um, was to the, to the beach. And in the exhibit, you see, the, I think, another field trip that was taking the Issei to, um, on a flower trip. But this, this was a trip to the beach. And we were, were seated, each one of us were seated next to an elder. And I remember the man I was sitting next to told me he had not seen the beach in 40 years. And I, you know, it just, it just broke my heart. But working together, having the Issei and the, and the hardcore work together was a real, I feel, a self-esteem type of thing because, you know, um, no, uh, the Issei were no longer being neglected. If they had a need, hardcore was there to help them, you know, help them out. And we were there at the Jack's Asian Involvement Office. And... Um, I know I'm going over my three minutes, but anyway, it was, um, I, I just wanted to bring that out because I, I feel that our movements were very linked in a part of continuum, a continuum of struggle in the United States. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
<laughs> I do have a loud voice, but not that loud. Okay. My name is Sandy Maishiro, and um, it's kind of nice that I'm following Mia because a lot of the memories that she just shared are some of the similar memories that I have. Um, I, I wasn't one of the original people in the Jack's office. I came there after I had left um, school. And um, when I was a student, when I was a college student, that was when I first started to question what was going on, what, what kind of a world are we living in, et cetera, et cetera. And I went to um, the University of California at Santa Barbara, which at that time was predominantly white. You could literally count the number of people of color on two hands. And so I got involved with EOP, and we started to recruit um, black and Chicano students and some Asian students to broaden and to diversify the, the university. And then I got involved with um, building an Asian American student union, building, fighting for ethnic studies and so forth, and being involved in the anti-war movement. And all during this time, I was thinking about what was going on at home, being from LA, being from the Crenshaw area, and I was hearing from my mother and from other people that there were all of these multiple deaths going on due to drug abuse. And it was becoming an epidemic. And some people from LA, um, Mo and Warren, Victor, anyways, they came to Santa Barbara to talk to students about getting involved in the community. And I felt this call to come back home. And so that's what I was going to do. But then my mother passed away. And so I ended up coming home sooner. And so my first um, um, involvement was with the Jack's office. And being a student and working around you know, ex-felons, ex-cons, drug users, so forth, I realized I had to become integrated in the community, that I only knew a certain part of the community, but that the community was much more multifaceted than my experience. And so during this time, there were a lot of things that were going on. There were study groups going on. There were women's groups going on. And I always had this question in my mind, what, where, where is this going? You know, I always want to know, like, what's the end result? And so as I became more involved, I started to realize that it was the system. It wasn't any one of us individually. It wasn't this thing or that thing. It wasn't just racism. It wasn't just sexism. It was a system, and that system was capitalism. And, and that we needed to confront that because all we were doing was putting Band-Aids on problems. And so the manifestations of our self-hatred, the manifestations of our alienation, the manifestations of class struggle were all parts of what came from <clears throat> capitalism. And so that led me to want to know, OK, what are the alternatives? And so I met people from San Francisco who were recruiting for the Vincent Amos Brigade. And the Vincent Amos Brigade was a project between the Cuban government and North American radicals to explain and to show and to demonstrate what socialism looks like. And so um, the first brigade was actually 50 years ago, and people went, <laughs> 50 years ago, and people went and cut cane. After two years of having North Americans come and attempt to cut cane, the Cubans decided, <laughs> that's too hard. They're, this time, the third time, we're going to do citrus production. And they were, the Cubans were very concerned because there was such a, um, lack of participation from people of color, primarily African Americans, Puerto Ricans, and Chicanos. And so um, there was a huge recruitment effort to get thoroughbred people to go to Cuba. And so that was my opportunity to go and see what is this all about. And in terms of what was a turning point in my life, I think um, spending six weeks in Cuba made a huge change for me in my life. It changed my life in terms of what I was gonna do with myself because you know, we all thought we were revolutionaries and the Cubans said, yeah, you guys are revolutionaries, but what do you do? <laughs> and we said, what do you mean what do we do? They said, do you work? And many of us said, well, we work in, you know, we're, we're doing serve the people programs. And they said, but do you work? And that's when I had decided I needed to finish school 
so that I could eventually be a teacher. And I became a teacher after I came back from Cuba. And then when I, but one of the main lessons I think that we learned in Cuba was the importance of internationalism. And that I think is some, something that's missing these days, is the sense of internationalism, the sense of um, third world unity. And that's what the Cubans were attempting to cultivate amongst us. We met fighters. Cuba was a place for um, fighters from, from Vietnam, from Angola, from all over Latin America to rest and recuperate and rejuvenate. And so we were given the opportunity to meet people from Vietnam, from, from all over the world. And it was very, very inspiring. And just being in Cuba and seeing the kind of society that's built on placing people before profits, on look, looking at people as having the potential to express the highest levels of humanity was very inspiring. And for us as North Americans to understand that racism and sexism can be eradicated in the context of eradicating a system that promotes it. Mm -hmm. So that was um, a huge turning point for me mm -hmm. for the rest of my life. Wow. I mean, you can see that we've got some great people up here with great stories. And unfortunately, we're running out of time. So <laughs> what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to collapse some things that I had talked about earlier. I want people on the panel to talk about what they see happening this moment. What gives you hope? What, what, less, what lessons have you learned that can you know, help us all understand how do we build our movement going forward? And I'll just start that. I'll take a moderator's prerogative and give a really short story about one thing I learned uh, during the anti-war movement. This is the anti-Vietnam War movement. Uh, so um, Nixon started bombing Cambodia, and overnight, thousands of college campuses went on strike. Uh, I was at UC Santa Cruz at the time. And you know, as an organizer, you print leaflets, you talk in classes, you, you try to like build people to do small solidarity actions. But overnight, the entire campus, thousands of people went on strike and shut the campus down. We didn't have classes for the rest of the year. You know? And what that taught me was that activists have a really important role to play. They sort of seed ideas. They sort of like provide a framework for people. But the movement is always 10 times bigger than the organizers. And you know, as an organizer, you feel like, oh, man, you know, what happened? I thought we would be leading this thing, but we're not leading it. Other people are leading it. And you know, the lesson for me was that's the way it should be. You know? And I think a, a writer who passed away recently, Martha Harnaker, talks a lot about this, that the role of the activist is to be a teacher, uh, to be kind of a, a resource. But you're not the movement. The movement is the people. So I just want to leave that and turn it over to other people. Who wants to, to share something? Any, anyone can go. Can you repeat the question one more time? It's more like, uh, what, from your experience, uh, what lessons have you learned from some of your work that will help address this issue of how do we get more people involved and how do we build a movement for change? Um, so I was born late, um, 78, so at martial law, right? Um, I didn't know anything about it, um, except that we had read all over the place. So my, I learned that my dad was, um, pro Marcos, right? Mm -hmm. And then, um, why? Because that's how he got his job and that's how my uncles got their job. So in the 80s, um, we live near the Malacanang Palace. That's our White House. Um, I didn't get to witness people power, right? But the work that I do now at the Filipino Workers Center, um, I'm able to do it because of the hard work of the people before me, right? So we just had our staff retreat, and I think the feedback that I gave to everyone was that I enjoy working, doing the work that I do because I work with different activists. I processed the citizenship application of, of one of our organizers. She was a torture victim, right? Mm -hmm. Writing that narrative, why do, and having that struggle for 10 years, why do I have to be a US citizen, right? Because people grow old, you know? 
We need those benefits, right? And because you've spent your life being an activist, you forget to do self-care. You forget to do what's right for you, right? And then I have another, our associate director is also a torture victim. But then things change. Now the government, the Commission on Human Rights, um, were able to give out, you know, give those payouts, right? So it's a little bit of money for all the trouble. They were incarcerated, they were tortured, they were beat up. I didn't know anything about it. But if, I think, in order to build movement, you need to know what's happening in the world and you need to localize that. I cannot do the work that I do if I'm on, only looking at California, if I'm only looking at USA. I need to go back home. I need to know, I need to ground myself, right? And I need to know what's happening in the world. And part of that, working at PwC, is creating that safe space, whether it's just a conversation with a volunteer, whether it's doing an intake, for someone who said, hey, I'm a victim of human trafficking, can you talk to me? And then there's that trauma, right? So you have to wear different hats. You need to get, you need to take care of yourself, right? Because nobody's gonna do that for you. There's burnout. And there's a lot of conversations that you have to get engaged in. Because though culturally, um, Asian women, um, Filipinas are subservient, right? And then when, you, when I occupy a space and they, oh, she speaks English, right? Um, I speak English because of my mom, of my mom sending money back home. I speak English because of my dad being my, my mom and my dad. I speak English because of that Catholic education, right? And that's what I take with me every day. So if um, at, at, at work, when somebody doesn't know how to speak um, in English, you have to be compassionate. You have to be, you have to not judge, right? So it has to start with a safe space at home, anywhere, with friends, because you need to, to resolve that conflict in you, right? Why am I doing this? I'm not doing this for money. Why am I doing this? Oh, because I want change. And the power of organizing is because you can change people's minds. And that's what makes it worth it. Yeah. Great. So um, just to follow up on that, I think you know we also have to look in the perspective of back in our day, uh, there was a whole flow of social movement. It wasn't just here in the US, it was also internationally, as has been brought up before, uh, third world struggles going along. And a lot of us took uh, um, inspiration from those struggles. So in the Philippines, uh, under the Marcos dictatorship, there was the New People's Army, there was the National uh, Democratic Front. And you know we were uh, actually supporting that. So it wasn't just against uh, martial law, it was actually to try and support the, the movement for social change in the Philippines. <laughs> And uh, you know there was a lot of uh, hesitancy in some places to to voice that loudly because we were always being accused of being communists, supporting communists. And so I think, uh, like even my parents, you know, they were very fearful. My name appeared on a blacklist before martial law was declared. Uh, that was exposed by our consulate here in LA at the time, who didn't want to go along with the uh, the government line and expose that list of uh, of uh, blacklisted people. Now, it's very interesting, because uh, the blacklist was supposed to make it so you couldn't go to the Philippines, or it, it, in our opinion, it was more of a way to try and intimidate the community to uh, stand down and keep their mouth shut. Uh, especially since you know all these uh, people were here in the US and we were all activists in different things, not about the Philippines at all, in fact. In fact, I still have never gone to the Philippines. So that's the irony of it, uh, but I'm, Still planning to go one of these days. <laughs> it's on the list. So I think, you know, we have to understand that the times back then and the times now are, are, are very different. And so you have different tactics for different uh, situations. And, but I think the bottom line, as has been brought up before, is, is organizing and education. Because education, you know, helps people understand the reasons of why they need to uh, struggle and, and organize. And it's not just enough to... Uh, go on, uh, feel good, you know, it makes me feel good if I help people out. You have to really go into, you know, what are the, 
what are the economic situations people face because of, of the system that they, they live under and the kinds of constraints and stress and worry and everything else that goes along with life here in, in American and capitalist country. So I think what's important is uh, that we uh, bridge those gaps of uh, generations like we're doing now. In our case, we, we, we looked uh, back to our Manongs who you know, were the, uh, the, the ones who started the United Farm Workers Strike. Uh, those Filipino Manongs who were already in the fields at age 60 years old, 50 years old, and it was like, you know, for them, it wasn't uh, just a matter of just getting a, f a few more dollars. It was really a matter of uh, continuing their livelihood. They had, no, uh, they had no pension plan. You know, it's like, it was like, this is, you know, if we don't get something soon, we're not going to have anything when we're uh, going to retire. What does that mean we retire for, as a farm worker? Uh, so uh, one of the things that uh, the union did start up and was the idea of, of Larry at Leong was, uh, Agbayani Village. And this is another uh, step in a lot of different things that help build your consciousness and to help you understand uh, what are the things that you have to do. So we had brigades that went up to uh, Delano to help build a retirement village for these Filipino Manongs so that they would have some place to stay uh, and not just the barracks that were, you know, the, the, uh, the, the bunk houses that they had to travel between uh, jobs, between cities as migrant workers. So those are things, you know, we have to talk about as well. But, you know, I also was a labor organizer for ASME during the UC uh, uh, building of uh, unions in the UC system. And uh, that taught me a lot about, you know, union organizing. Some of it in a bad way, but uh, also, just because, uh, you know, what was interesting there is that because as project staff, which means we were like the lowest level organizer, uh, we couldn't organize ourselves which was really uh, told to us up front by uh, our management in the union that, uh, you know, if we catch any of you guys trying to organize among yourselves, then we're going to have to fire you. So, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot to say about uh, organizing within the union, <laughs> too. So you have to be ready to fight on all kinds of fronts and be ready for different kinds of situations. Great. I want to leave time for audience questions. And so I'm going to ask each panelist, to um, just really briefly tell me how you feel at this moment. What makes you hopeful? What makes you fearful? And we'll start with Sandy and go down. What makes me hopeful is seeing lots of resistance, resistance on many, many different levels, um, and seeing, you know, like the Fort Sill incident, that made me feel very hopeful. What makes me feel what? fearful? fearful? Uh, <laughs> Well, we, we, I think we'll all have the same answer. I think the environment of hate and xenophobia and white supremacy. Well, what makes me hopeful is, and I'm thinking back to the um, Japanese American redress and reparations struggle where I think for me that was like the proudest moment of my life. I worked with a group called National Coalition for Redress and Reparations, which was a grassroot, waged a grassroots struggle and really fought to, to enable, um, get hearings in, in all the major cities so we could get the, get the most people to testify. And I think when people came forward and stood up after 40 years and told their story, it really brought the community together. And that victory was really important. And, but I, I wanted to say, I think the past work that we've done, you know, with other third world communities really showed up, showed up because when we had those hearings or when we were um, lobbying for redress, we had the full support of the Latino and the African American community, Native American communities, and, and other, of course, API communities, and it was, really a people's victory. And so what makes me hopeful today is that it was a political education for the whole Japanese American community. And I think um, people realize that with that victory um, comes a, a, a responsibility almost, an understanding of our history and a feeling of responsibility that we don't want to see this repeated again. And so, and during 9-11, one of the first groups that stepped up in, in support of the Muslim community were uh, JAs. And, and then as um, Sandy mentioned, you know, today the linkages are being made with you know, the detention center, the concentration camps, the separation of families. And um, 
again, the community has has been um, coming forward, and I think that's that's really hopeful. And the the fear, of course, is that the Democrats don't shoot themselves in the foot, <laughs> and we have to bear this. <sighs> Number forty five. You can't even say his name. Yeah, but I I'm actually I'm hopeful. You know, because there, there, as Sandy said, there's more resistance, and I, I don't think we'll allow it to happen again. Um, I'll start with what I'm fearful about, and then I'll go into hopeful, uh, or not hopeful, but um, <laughs> I guess I'm sure, yeah, I'll find the right word there. But um, I guess in terms of fear, um, I, I think what I'm fearful of is just how much of our resiliency is being tested in this moment. Um, just in terms of the resilience of our base, the resilience of the people who are working and surviving every day, um, both within this country and outside of it. Um, and I think for me, being able to not only see, like being a witness of what's happening at the Southern border, being a witness to like what's happening in my neighborhood, in our neighborhood in Cape Town and in, in our neighborhoods in, you know, uh, in Orange County, I think for me, like, the resiliency that's being tested every day and how much of our humanity is being tested every day because of the system we grew up in and that we live in right now. I think that's my fear. Um, but out of that, um, what I see is opportunity. And I believe that these crises in a moment, similar to Prop 187 in the early 90s, similar to the, the, the hate that we had faced when, um, in back in 2001 when, uh, when we started to be, start resisting at the federal level for increasing pathways and citizenship to undo all the hate in, in the 1990s, I see an opportunity to be able to leverage crisis into, an op into a moment to advance our long-term agenda. And what I mean by that is that, what does it mean for us to be able to no longer live in a world with a racialized, a, a racialized capitalism in our country? What does it mean for us to be able to live with bold policy, to be able to motivate our folks in a way that where we can think globally about what we believe the world should look like and act locally about what, what, kind of, what kind of liberation that we really want to see in our community. What does it really mean for every person in Los Angeles to actually have uh, the right to, right to true public goods in the this, in this city? What does it mean for us to all each have housing, food, water? I mean, for us right now, this is like the moment and opportunity where we don't actually have to dream about this anymore that we can actually make that into action. And I believe that this moment in crisis actually leverages the opportunity for us to be able to build a membership that the world has never seen before. I really believe that. And I think for me, um, when I think about hope, hopeful, I see the faces here, that makes me feel hopeful. I see the, the faces that come through our doors every day, folks who are monolingual Korean American seniors who are trying to find a home folks who are being able to come through our doors right now to be able to find access to school. I, I think for me right now, like that's the, that's the hope I see. And I believe that um, not only are we agents of change for that type of hope, but I believe that, um, that this is the moment, even from difference from two years ago, to be able to advance that type of agenda that we've never seen before. It's up to us to not only to dream it, to share that, but to build it. And that's our responsibility. So that's what makes me hopeful. I guess for me, um, I'm hopeful every day because um, my work is direct services. I'm a case manager and it kind of has that dual role to it. Because when they go to the office, um, do you think I have a case? I have to go to an attorney and make that assessment, right? I'm hopeful because people are showing up. I'm hopeful because people are stepping up. Volunteers are going to our center. Interns are coming in and uh, what do you need help with? Um, uh, we're training interns. We're working with attorneys, right? Why? Because there's a need and they are listening. Um, I am fearful because um, at some point from 2016 up to this point, I, I got scared. I got scared because USCIS immigration started denying these trafficking visas. The USCIS changed their policies. And now um, for the 40 cases that we've filed, half of them are asking for 
additional evidence. Why are you still here in the US? Why don't you just go home? You're, you were um, trafficked before, but we don't see why you have to stay here. You have to explain that your continuing presence in the US is on account of your original trafficking. As Filipinos, um, when you tell us to go through therapy, that's insulting. We think, you think that we are crazy. So we wanna change that framework we want to change how Filipinos view mental health, right? We want to change how we look at culture. We want to change how, you know, domestic workers should have, you know, dignity. And that's what we've been doing. Um, the Cali in last month, the governor signed the state budget and that meant that $5 million will go to education and outreach efforts for domestic workers, domestic worker rights um, through the Department of Labor Standards and Enforcement. That means our work, the coalition work on um, domestic workers, overtime pay, um, that will continue. And this month, we're going to Congress because we're filing for the National um, Domestic Bill of Rights. So I think that's progress. <laughs> right. Thank you. Um, uh, <laughs> so, um, just shameless plug, therapy is awesome, everyone should do it. Um, <laughs> um, and then uh, what makes me fearful, um, I think uh, one of the things that makes me fearful is a, um, when we're not centering uh, the folks at the margins, I think it it's definitely takes another skill to be able to move ourselves away from like the center of like the conversation and like center the voices of working class, um, working class, just folks on the margins, LGBTQ folks. Um, and it's just really hard sometimes when you just don't know where you're at. But I think like what's hopeful is that in terms of like, you just, that's part of learning. We're always learning. I think that's what's hopeful about our youth. Um, kids have so much energy. They will bring so much joy to the work that they do, as well as creativity and art. And I really look up to my kids, really, for learning how to really stay invigorated in this work and to keep pushing. So. Yeah. So, um, hmm. so I'm not going to talk so much about what we're fearful about, because I think everybody knows about all the fears that show up on the news every night. So I think uh, what I'm, again, what I think what's uh, hopeful is that, you know, that more and more folks are, are trying to organize themselves and at the same time are trying to educate themselves. That's why I'm in the field of education and also librarian. You have to know your history in order to move forward, right? And I think, uh, you know, as a teacher, I'm doing my part in just that uh, education of the students that I have, uh, one of who's here tonight. Actually, where'd he go? <laughs> okay, so anyway, we'll talk about him later. Um, uh, anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's important that we, we try to continue that. And then I am uh, also encouraged by, you know, uh, we learned these lessons from the past. So back in the day, we were fighting against the Marcos dictatorship. Now we have another dictator in the Philippines. Duarte is also there, and we're just trying to, you know, there's a lot of comparisons with him and Trump, right? And so... It's, it's uh, important to also recognize that there's uh, parallels that, that continue on and that there are uh, struggles that have to continue and learn the lessons from the past. So um, count on history and count on education. Um, so I'm actually going to address um, uh, like a campaign that also seems in life, but can also like, um, connect to this question. Um, so in February, I was, I organized a campaign and um, that, I, we organized a, um, a GSA Day for Racial Justice in front of the Metropolitan Detention Center. Mm -hmm. And that's where our folks are locked up. That's where, um, frankly, like, um, um, so, when I organized that campaign, um, we we didn't expect a lot of people to show up. We um, we and I'm glad a lot of people didn't show up because the people that were actually there were the people that were actually um, through it. Were for prison abolition. Were for 
um, the end of borders, the end of DHS, the end of ICE, um, the end of um, racism. And when you like, when you realize that when um, in our immigration history has not been, the United States has been riddled with racism with like, xenophobia all its life, and just because Trump was elected doesn't mean that people haven't been facing issues for like the longest time. Um, and when there were folks that talked about Obama deported my mom, um, there were folks that talked about um, how indigenous people did not have um, prisons, um, that they didn't rely on these systems in order to um, rehabilitate people, um, that we need transformation within our systems and we need to upend these systems. Um, and when the people that were there were, um, were, were youth, um, were LGBTQ youth of color, were disabled youth, were trans youth, were fat youth, were black youth, were indigenous youth, were Latinx youth, were undocumented youth, were ev like, that is what gives me hope. Um, this vision of intersectional organizing, this idea of us showing up for each other, us knowing that the liberation of the third world peoples, the liberation of um, people of color, um, it's all connected. And black liberation, indigenous liberation is our liberation. Um, and we just have to understand that and make sure that, again, we center the voices that are most marginalized or are the ones that are not um, often highlighted. Um, so youth, um, like centering the voices of youth, um, they're our future and they know um, a lot more than we think they do. Um, and they're taking leadership positions, they're um, organizing themselves. Um, we are, um, we recognize our ancestors, we recognize our ancestors. Um, we, we chant the words of Asado, we chant the words of Filipinx and Latinx um, farm workers. Like, we recognize this history and we're using it in order to um, create a liberated world for not just um, our people, or the concept of our people is weird too. Um, <laughs> and like, we're, liberation for everyone, all oppressed peoples um, is connected and we, we, we need to realize that. And my hope um, is within, my hope is every, what I see every day, um, as y'all mentioned. Um, and my fear is also um, what Tito said, the not, not centering the voice of the most marginalized, not centering um, black trans women, not centering um, black disabled youth, um, not centering a lot of people that um, their liberation, without their liberation, we are not all liberated. Um, and that's something we need to recognize. Um, Great. What gives, what gives me fear? Um, patriarchy, white supremacy, and capitalism. <laughs> um, yeah, along those lines that folks have already mentioned, um, speaking about the fear, I think that there's just so much at stake and we see so many people being harmed every day right now. You know, I mentioned um, trans women of color being murdered, you know, black folks are getting murdered. Um, you know, what's happening at the border and with immigrant families um, and what's happening overseas in all these other countries where, you know, we are having direct involvement in tearing up people's lives. It's, it's really scary um, that this is happening every minute as, you know, we sit in this room. Um, so it's just so much at stake um, along with our environment. And so that, you know, really keeps me up at night sometimes, especially as I think about what kind of world um, Cosmos is going to grow into. Um, but on the flip side, what gives me a lot of hope is that I feel like we, as kind of like a broader society, are having these really deep discussions about, you know, about capitalism, about socialism, um, about, you know, misogyny and, uh, you know, racism and white supremacy, talking about, you know, presidential candidates mentioning reparations. I mean, this is stuff that, you know, uh, four years ago, even we weren't, you know, five years ago, we weren't really like having those kinds of dialogues. And so I feel like that's just a really big shift in the way we're thinking about, you know, how we approach our society as a whole and like what kinds of systems are going to represent like the kind of values that we really um, want to uplift. And so I think that's really hopeful because I see that as kind of a broader shift in the way people are talking about it. And I know that when 
I go to like, not just the chosen family barbecue where it's like safe, but you know, to like the broader family barbecue where it's like, all right, I'm mixing in with like all my cousins and I'm like, oh, you know, but you know, just, you know, like others have said, like we gotta keep organizing. So I'm having those conversations and I hope everyone is too, but like, you know, the conversations are just sort of like really dynamic right now. And people are just talking about this stuff. And it's something that, you know, I think is more out in the open. And so I think folks are considering that like, hey, maybe, you know, we should do things a little differently. And I think that's really exciting. Wow. Thank you all. You know, I wish we had more time. It's actually nine o'clock now. And um, I, out of respect for the workers who have to clean up this building, we're gonna have to end the panel without having audience questions tonight. But I think it just points out that we need more of these discussions. We need more sessions that maybe where everyone here is in smaller groups with you all to have these dialogues because there's a really important conversations, lots at stake. And the other thing that maybe people didn't mention is time is fucking running out, you know? <laughs> we have to save the planet like today. You know, we're not gonna be able to do a lot of the other things we wanna do if we don't have a planet to live on, all right? So I wanna thank Janum, Visual Communications, all the panelists, all of you for coming. I think um, people will be around and outside in the lobby for a little bit longer if you wanna ask them questions, but I'm sure they'll be happy to answer questions. We'll be around. All right. Come chat, we're friendly. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.